Today's Virtual Spirit Day is favorite team day to celebrate all of our fabulous teams that we don't get to see play. So my team today is the Vikings. Put on your favorite jersey, snap a photo of yourself, maybe um, choose something that you really wish you could be watching right now but aren't watching, and upload that into our Spirit Day folder so we can all enjoy them. Today we are reading chapter nine of Shiloh, and if you remember, Marty was having a grand old time with his friend Shiloh. The breeze is blowing cool air in from the west, and I figure I'm about as happy right then as I can, as you can get in your whole life. And then I hear someone say, Marty? And I look up, and there's Ma. Chapter nine. I can't move. It seems as if the sky's swirling around me, tree branches going every which way. Ma's face even looks different from down on the ground. Shiloh, of course, goes right over, wagging his tail, but all the steam's gone out of me. How long have you had this dog up here? She asks, not a trace of a smile on her face. I sit up real slow and swallow. About a week, I guess. You'd had Judd's dog up here a week? and you told him you didn't know where it was? I didn't say I didn't know. He asked had I seen him, and I said I hadn't seen him in our yard. That much was true. Ma comes around the trunk of the pine tree and unfastens the wire that holds the fencing closed and lets herself in. She crouches in the soft pine needles and Shiloh starts leaping up on her with his front paws licking her face. I can't tell at first how she feels about him, the way she leans back away from his dripping tongue. Then I see her hand reach out with its short, smooth fingers and stroke him. So we've got ourselves a secret, she says at last. And when I hear her say, we, I feel some better. Not a lot, but some. How come you follow me up here tonight? I wanna know. Now I can tell for sure her eyes are smiling, but her lips are still set. Well, I had my suspicions before, but it was the squash that did it. The squash? Marty, I never knew you to eat more than a couple bites of squash in your life. And when you put away a spoonful of that to eat later, I knew for sure it wasn't you doing the eating. And then the way you've been sneaking off every night? She stops stroking Shiloh and turns on me. I wish you told me. I figured you'd make me give him back. This dog doesn't belong to you. Mine more than Judd's, I say hotly. He paid money for him, but I'm the one who loves him. That doesn't make him yours. Not in the eyes of the law, it doesn't. Well, that kind of what kind of law is it, Ma, that lets a man mistreat his dog? Ma just sighs then and starts stroking Shiloh's head. Shiloh wiggles a few inches closer to her on his belly, rests his nose against her thigh, tail going wick whack, wick whack, wick whack. Finally, Ma says, your dad don't know about him? I shake my head, more silence. And then she says, I never kept a secret from your dad in 14 years we've been married. You ain't gonna tell him? Marty, I've got to. If he ever finds out about this dog and knows I knew but didn't tell him, how could he ever trust me? If I keep this one secret from him, he'll think many, m maybe there, may there are more. He'll make me give it back to Judd, Ma. I could hear my voice shaking now. I know he will. What else can we do? I can feel hot tears in my eyes now and try and keep them from spilling out. I turn my head till, it, till they go away. Judd Travers ever come here to get his dog? He'll have to fight me to get it. Marty, listen, Ma, just for one night, I promise you won't, let, you won't tell Dad so I can figure out something. Can she tell? Can tell she's thinking on it. You aren't fixing to run off with this dog, are you? Marty, don't ever run away from a problem. I don't answer because that very thing crossed my mind. I can't promise not to tell your dad tonight if you can't I can't promise not to tell your dad tonight if you can't promise not to run off. I won't run off, I say. Then I won't tell him tonight. Or in the morning neither, I add. I got at least to have at least one day to think. Don't know what good it will do though. Have already thought till my brains are dry. Ma put out both hands now and scratches behind Shiloh's ear. He licks her all up and down his arms. His name's Shiloh, I tell her pleased. After a while, Ma gets up. You come back to the house now? In a bit, I answer. It's hard to say how she feels after she leaves. Glad, in a way, that somebody knows, 
that I don't have to carry this whole secret on my head alone, but more scared than glad. Have me just one day to think of what to do and not any closer to any answer than I've been before. I'd spent all my can money on stuff to feed Shiloh. Only money I have now to my name is a nickel I found out by the road. Judd won't sell Shiloh, won't, sh won't sell Shiloh's spit for a nickel. My first thought is to give him to somebody else and not tell them whose dog it is, then tell Ma that Shiloh would run off, but that, but that would be two more lies to add to the pack. Word would get out somehow or other and Judd would see David Howard or Mike Wells walking his dog and then the war would really start. All I can think of is to take Shiloh down to Friendly the next day, draw me up a big sign that says free world's best dog or something and hold it along the road to Sisterville hoping that some stranger drive along will get a warm spot in his heart for Shiloh, stop his car and take him home. And I won't ask him where his home is neither. So when Ma asks me where the dog is, I can tell her honest, I don't know. When I get back to the house, dad's washing up at the pump, using grease to get the oil off of his arms. He's yelling at Darylin and Becky, who are playing on the doorway, screen wide open, letting in the moths. I go inside and Ma's putting the dishes away in the kitchen, lifting them out of the draining rack and scanning them and stacking the, the plates on the shelf. She's got the radio on and is humming along with some country music. It's you I want to come home to. It's you to break my bread. It's you to light my fire. It's you to share my bed. She sort of blesses when she sees me there by the refrigerator listening to her sing. I know I'm not going to sleep much that night. I sit on the couch staring at the TV, but not really watching while Ma gives Becky her bath. Then I wait till Daryl Lynn is out of the bathroom to go so I can take my own bath. Don't know if I soaked up or not. Don't even know if I washed my feet. I go back in the living room and Ma's had, Ma has my bed made up there on the sofa. The house gets dark, the door closed, and then just the night sounds come from outside. No, there's a piece of cardboard somewhere out there, somewhere out in the shed I can print on. There won't be any trouble getting Shiloh to friendly either. I'll put that rope on his collar and he'll follow me along good as anything. We won't take the main road though, in case Judd's out in his truck. Take every back road I can find. Then I'll plant myself on the road to Sisterville, hold that sign, Shiloh waiting beside me, wondering what is what it is we're going to do next. What am I going what am I fixing to do anyway? Give him the first give him to the first car that stops? Don't even know the person driving? Might even be I'll give Shiloh to somebody who will treat him worse than Judd Travers. Now that Shiloh's come to trust me, here I'm here I am getting ready to send him off again. I feel like there's a tank truck sitting on my chest and I can hardly breathe. Got one day to decide what to do with Shiloh and nothing I think of seems right. I hear Shiloh making a noise up on the far hill in his pen. Not now, Shiloh, I whisper. You've been good all this time. Don't start now. Can it be he knows that what I'm fixing to do? Then I hear a yelp, a loud, a loud yelp then a snarl and a growl and suddenly the air is filled with yel yelps and it's the worst kind of noise you can think of, a dog being hurt. I leap out of bed, thrust my feet into my sneakers and with the shoelaces flying, I'm racing through the kitchen toward the back door. The light goes on, I can hear dad's voice saying, get a flashlight, but I'm already out the back porch then running up the hill. There are footsteps behind me, dad's gaining on me, can hear Shiloh howl like he's been torn in two and my breath comes shorter and shorter trying to get there in time. By the time I reach the pen, Dad's cut up with me and he's got the flashlight turning, turned toward the noise. The beam searches out the pine trees, the fencing, the lean-to, and then I see his big German shepherd, mean as nails, hunched over Shiloh there on the ground. The shepherd's got blood in his mouth and jaws, and as Dad takes another step forward, it leaps over the fence the same way it got in and takes off through the woods. I unfasten the wire next to the pine tree, legs like rubber, hardly holding me up. I kneel down by Shiloh. He's got blood on his side, his ear, a big open gash on one leg, and he don't move, not an inch. I bend over, my forehead against him, my hand on his head. He's dead, I know it. I'm screaming inside. And then I feel his body sort of shiver and his mouth moving just a little, like he's trying to get his tongue out to lick my hand. And I'm bent over there in the beam of dad's flashlight, bawling and I don't even care. That finishes up chapter nine. You'll have to listen to chapter 10 to see what happens if Shiloh's okay and how his dad responds to not knowing about the dog in the woods. Have a great day.